What up, what up, party people? Happy Sunday. As always, it is a damn good day to have a damn good day. And I'm so excited about today's episode. I've been waiting a long time for this, and you guys will understand why. But before we get into that, let me start with a book that I'm enjoying. I'm currently reading this book called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Joe combines the fields of quantum physics, neuroscience, brain chemistry, biology, and genetics to show you what is truly possible in creating your own reality. I know personally in my life, I'm always trying to figure out a way to eliminate negative thoughts because you can control your brain, you control your life. And if you're new to the podcast, our mission here is twofold. To educate aspiring entrepreneurs by dissecting the come up stories of incredible humans by extracting the golden nuggets that you can apply now to better your life. And second, to have all my friends that are making moves, to meet my other friends that are making moves, to create one giant community of extraordinary people. And if you follow the podcast, you know I'm constantly talking about a company called Trueface. I have worked with Trueface for the past four plus years and it has been an incredible journey. A little bit about Sean Moore. Prior to Trueface, Sean co-founded two startups in the content and mobile application space. He has lived on four different continents and regularly participates in international communities for the advancement of global entrepreneurship. Sean has been featured in TechCrunch, Forbes, CNET, The Wall Street Journal, Mashable, and others. In this episode, we discuss things like the future of AI and machine learning, concerns over data storage, racial bias, and China, a recent viral app, Face app, and concerns over data privacy, and so much more topics that we just got to jump into it. As a reminder, you can catch all of our episodes live on YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we ask you to like, comment, and share and enjoy the good vibe. Also, big shout out to everybody that's been tagging us in their Instagram stories. Your feedback is truly valuable. And so without further ado, welcome to episode 37 with the CEO and co-founder of True Face, Sean Moore. Boom. Live, Sean Moore, everybody. Sean, how you doing? Well, Ian, how are you? Man, we've been waiting for do this for a very long time. <laughs> I'm excited to have you on. Uh, beautiful day. We're out here in Venice, California. New office. Do you like it here? I love it here. It's fantastic. And uh, yeah, so for everyone that's been listening to the podcast, you're in for a treat today. We actually have the CEO of Trueface, my good friend Sean Moore. If you guys follow the podcast, you know that I've been working with Trueface for the last four and a half years. We've been on quite a mission, quite a journey in the worlds of startups. And honestly, Trueface and Sean is a big reason for me just getting so curious about this industry and about what's going on in the world and technology in general. So really fired up to come today and kind of give you a different perspective on our business. You know, you're going to be hearing me answer, ask a lot of questions more about the industry in general versus, you know, some sort of biased thing about me being involved with Trueface and what's going on here. And I'm really excited to kind of break down your journey, Sean, you and Nazar's journey, and talk about just kind of like what got you here. Because damn, dude, it's been <laughs> a lot has changed in the last six and a half years. It has. It's been quite the journey. And, and so what, what school did you come from? Uh, SMU in Dallas. Okay, so I have seen, it seems like you have had so many successful friends that have come out of SMU. It was a great place to go to school and a great place to meet people. Yeah, you guys crushed it. And how did you first get involved in tech? Like when you were in college, were you all about this life? Or I think you were a finance major, right? Both Nazar and I were finance majors, um, but we had a kind of a weird interest in technology and in like automated processes and just really the efficiency, um, you know, efficiency of receiving information, sending information. And so in 2009, while we were juniors at school, we started our first company together uh, while in school. And it's, it's that standard story of everyone going out on Saturdays. And we were in uh, what we had turned into an office, was I think our fourth bedroom in the house that we were staying in. And so we were in there, you know, researching and understanding how we could take financial information from the U.S. and port it overseas. Okay, well, a lot of people are typically not doing that in school. So that's pretty <laughs> legit. And, and what was that company called? Uh, it was called A Superior Creation. How did you first meet Nazar? Uh, we met through the business school, but then a lot of mutual friends. And so we ended up being in the same fraternity, and um, that just perpe perpetuated our friendship. And then seeing each other in class all the time, we ended up being in an entrepreneurship class together, so working on a few projects together, and we just got along. It's interesting because you guys have been um, co-founders of this company for a very long time. And it's like when you're a co-founder, I mean, you spend so much time with him. It's kind of like you're almost like married to him in a certain way. It's more than almost you are. <laughs> what has been that journey just like with between the two of you and just the chemistry wise and just working through all the challenges? How do you think that has kind of progressed your guys' friendship and, and business relationship? I think it's, you know, starting a business as friends is always very difficult. 
Um, and especially during a time in your life where you're trying to understand who you are as a person. Right. So you're growing up a lot together. You're going through those fights, those stressful scenarios. And, you know, it's just really important to, to kind of strip away your ego and remember why you're there. And there were countless times that we were together in Colorado where, you know, tension was very high, funding was low, we were worried about what to do next, and we had to sit down and just say, okay, why did we, why did we start this in the first place? Why are we here together? It's because we trust one another, and we both have a similar goal for this. And so, you know, you do go through those ups and downs, those emotional roller coasters, you fight. I mean, we, we were living in a studio together in Dallas, and at one point we were at each other so hard that we were wearing head, I mean, we were living, you know, five feet from one another. We were wearing headphones and working because we didn't want to talk to one another. <laughs> and so we would just communicate online. And, uh, you know, you get to those points, and I think that that's, that's why we have the relationship we do today and that's why it's that strong is because we went through those ups and downs we, we addressed that early on in our relationship and, and it's helped the company flourish so yeah it's you and nazar in a studio going through these ups and downs at one point you're putting headphones on because you can't even talk to each other but you're committed i mean when you start a business with someone it's a commitment and it's not just uh it's a marriage you know you gotta you gotta do a lot so that relationship has come a long ways what do you think are some skills that you think you could share that are good for being able to mitigate disputes within founders you know the reason that arguments always come around are one of two things it's one there's an emotion there there's ego attached to it and you think you're right um the other is the logical approach and so i think it's it's stripping away you know what you think is right and doing what's best for the company because at the end of the day you know if that decision doesn't work you'll try the next decision so you know we had to learn that very early on um, any time that we got to a big decision it would have affected the trajectory of the company significantly and had we made the wrong decision and let that linger long enough the company would have been over and so it was you know it was just stripping away the the thought that I'm right you're wrong and is this the best move for the company right so at the end of the day, it's just going back to your roots and taking away the ego. The ego is not your amigo. Ego <laughs> kills everyone. So Chewy, let's talk about Chewy. How did Chewy come into play? First of all, what does Chewy even mean? We were over in, uh, so back up, you know, Nazar went to, to Morocco after college. I went down to Chicago, or up to Chicago, and uh, I was working at Merrill Lynch, and he was running for parliament. So two very different routes, and we stayed in touch and uh, we got to talking in late 2011 about reinvigorating our entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, it, it was one of those risks that, you know, if, if you take it, you've got to jump all in. And so I ended up leaving my job at Merrill Lynch in early 2012, booking a one-way ticket out to North Africa. And we sat down, put pen to paper, did a lot of research and started to understand and, and kind of project and predict where we thought the market was moving from a, a technical standpoint. And we were, you know, Kickstarter was new at the time. So things like Ninja Blocks automation tools were coming out. And we wanted to, to kind of piggyback what had already been built. And that was sensor technology. And so doing some research, we found, you know, facial recognition through an FBI paper. And uh, it, it was something that sparked our interest as like, is this the way we identify humans in the future when sensor technology becomes more apparent and, and more widespread? And so it, it was really pairing a few different technologies together and then having the desire to commercialize facial recognition for access control in the home. And you started with access control. Was that you, you saw the smart doorbell? When did you have that eureka moment? We're going to create a smart doorbell. Uh, it was in early 2012. I wouldn't say it was one specific moment. Uh, it was a lot of deliberate thinking. And, and you know, fortunately, being in, in Morocco, there isn't a whole lot of connectivity. You've got a lot of time to sit and think. And I think that was critical to, to how we had formulated the idea of, of let's start this company, let's work on this, you know, two finance guys, one with a background at, in investment banking and one with a parliament background now trying to build hardware. Uh, it sounds funny and it is funny, but we were able to do it. You know, we were able to surround ourselves with the right people, um, the right minds and, and really just, you know, learn very quickly so that we could understand what would make us successful in that market. And the hardware space is interesting. Just going through different accelerators and back during those times. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend hardware? I would not recommend hardware. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in 2012, 2013, I would. I think that was when the, the hardware revolution was happening and there was a lot of funding behind hardware companies. And, um, it, you know, it's just very difficult to do. And now given our 
our political atmosphere, uh, manufacturing in China is a risk to people. It was a risk to us then, so we went down to South America, as you remember, in Colombia and manufacture down there. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult game to play, and I'm very happy we're no longer in it. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. So you embedded face recognition onto customized hardware. Was that, what other challenges did you face during that process? That was the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, finding, finding individuals with that level of talent is difficult, especially when it was, it was hard for us to vet those people. So we were having to bring in advisors um, from our networks to vet these hardware engineers or mechanical engineers, electrical engineers that could help us design a doorbell that, you know, recognize someone's face and unlock the door. Um, you know, the challenges that we ran into there is everything works really well in a lab. And then when you put it on 10 people's houses, you know, houses, it, it doesn't work that right. well, as you're well aware. So it's, it's getting from that prototype MVP into actual beta and then production. And there are just so many hurdles along the way and, and you need capital and you need the team and, you know, you really need the, the mentality behind the people to keep that drive on. Right. I mean, one of the best ways to learn is to jump in and do it, right? You, you, you can read all the books in the world, but until you're actually living it is when you're actually learning. What did you think you learned or some key things that have kind of helped you today um, during those years with Chewy? Perseverance. Um, I would say that's the biggest one. You've got, you've got to have the attitude and it's got to come from within. Um, you know, I, I like to say that quite often, but you have to have that drive yourself. It's not taught. It's not learned. If you don't have it, if it's not there, it, it's hard to invigorate that in yourself. And so for us, it was, it was never, a, never a question about success or failure. It was, if this doesn't work, what do we try now? Right. And so, you know, we've always had that mentality and, and I think with any roadblock, you know, it's, it's the adversity that, that hits you in the face. How do you react to it? And so if you have, you know, choice A, B, and C, neither of them work, you know, what's, or none of those three work, what's next? And, and I think that, you know, thankfully Nazar and I surrounded ourselves with good people who, who pushed us through those hard times. Right. And, uh, you know, we are fortunate to have a great team and, and you've been on the team now for, for quite some time. So you've been able to live that too. Right. Yeah. Do you think that advisors is plays a critical role in the early stages specifically of a startup? I wouldn't say formal advisors. I would say surround yourself with people that want to help genuinely, not that are incentivized to help. Um, and, and that's something that we learned early on because, you know, we were told that you've got to bring advisors on, you've got to, you know, compensate them in some way. And you run into an issue there where, you know, they're, they're more worried about their compensation than they are helping you. And so you just have to, to really find people that are interested in your well-being and genuinely want to see you succeed, and they will give you the best advice. So how long was Chewy, uh, the tenure of Chewy? Where did Chewy, the name, come from? It was a Swahili word for leopard. <laughs> and, you know, we were in North Africa. Uh, we were thinking about names, and, and when we kind of took a look at ourselves, we were two finance individuals trying to get into tech, so a very difficult thing to do. And the leopard is the smallest of the big four jungle cats, uh, but it's the most adaptable. And so adaptability was the word that we always stuck with. Hell yeah. <laughs> Everyone needs a Swahili <laughs> name in their life. So yeah, and now is, so that was three and a half years, you said? So we started in 2012, incorporated in 2013, launched a product March of 2014, and then ran that through June of 2017. What was the most exciting time you can vividly remember during that run right there? Where you're like, oh, snap, like this is real. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think raising money from, from what you learn or hear about or read about on TechCrunch, when a company raises money, you feel like you've hit some mark of success. And, and I think that's a little, del I mean, a little delusional um, because it's not a mark of success. It's, it's a mark of you've got people now that trust you or you know, that trust your vision, but it by no means entitles you to any sort of success. And so I think initially that was one of our goals was to raise money for the idea. But then you, know, you start to see it, it, adoption is the key metric there. It's how many people are using the technology. So I would say the most exciting piece there was we put the, the product on something similar to Kickstarter. Uh, we just ran it on our own site. And to see, you know, $30,000, $40,000 in orders come in, 
in 30 days is a pretty pretty unique and amazing feeling. It's something that you know we took from pen to paper, our, our minds to pen and paper, manufactured it, and people want it. Um, that's a pretty cool feeling. Do you think you're like me? Just seeing you and you're, you've changed a lot over the past year. You've grown as a person, and this isn't just me stroking your ego. But I mean, let's be real. You know where we you guys were back, especially you and Nazar back in Chewy days to where you are now. Do you think all of those little wins and those little successes and those failures really? are create who you are today i do i think they're very important and you know there's times that you've told me to to stop and smell the roses because you know it's difficult for us to celebrate little victories even though we know we're supposed to because we've got this long goal and this this big vision in, in our in our minds and i think it is critical to celebrate those little victories because it's what propels you to the next one and you know a lot of the times we get caught up in what we're doing and, and, you know, we don't see it as success, but if, if you look at the outside looking in or, you know, even you, you'd stop me and be like, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> You've got to at least, you know, put a smile on your face about it. So I think it is important to, to celebrate those little victories. Right. And then don't get compare-itis because when you're always comparing yourself. Right. Right. You can't do it. You can't do it. Yeah. You're always getting sad. So now you're looking at this product, you have built this hardware product. You're like, okay, this is working, but I think that we have a better opportunity out there. What was the thought process that went into the transition from Chewy to, I believe it was TrueFace.ai? Yeah, so we, we had gone through the uh, fun process of applying to Y Combinator, as you remember. And that was just a, an interesting situation in and of itself because we got to the final round interviews and I was on a plane and you had submitted the documents. And so in those final round uh, interviews, they had told us that it's the first time ever that anyone had submitted documents that was not a founder or CEO of the company. <laughs> and they took that as a lack of interest from my part and as ours part because we let someone else do it. And, you know, I fought back. I said, doesn't this mean that we trust, you know, the people on our team to, to do this? And we went back and forth, back and forth. But ultimately, you know, during those conversations, they they... they made us realize some of the things that we were doing that that could have been better and and one of the things that they actually pushed us to continue on with hardware and so in our minds we were thinking well okay how you know how do we make this work to fit their mold to to fit into you know to their program because we really wanted to be part of Y Combinator so we were still in San Francisco thinking about that applied to 500 startups and during that process they, they kind of urged us to to think about what's outside of the hardware so what could we do that's more valuable that can scale faster we can distribute a lot more and I think it was at that point where you know I remember it vividly um, we had just eaten dinner we walked down to the pier in San Francisco and we were talking and you know we had spent four years at this time building hardware and we said okay well this is a very you know difficult thing to talk about but should we just stop should we stop and focus in on what we think we can be the best at and we think it's facial recognition and you know the next two three weeks we let that simmer and and we went back to 500 startups and said this is what we're thinking what do you guys think and they're like it's amazing you know we we want you in the program and so that was that was really the turning point. It was being turned down from Y Combinator for a supposed lack of interest uh, or lack of dedication into 500 startups telling us we think there's a, a bigger market here if you guys move to software. And so you know we had pitched them on that, and and ultimately it was the best move we could have ever made. And then in, I think it was June 27th we launched the TrueFace brand, um, shut down the manufacturing facility in Columbia. And, you know, we supported the rest of those Chewy units for their existence, but, but ultimately started working on, you know, can we provide the best facial recognition software to the market? And even today, you know, that's not all we do and that's really not the goal anymore, but that got us to the next point that got us to the next milestone. And we were able to partner with one of the largest hospitality companies in the world six months later. And so it's, you know, it's seeing that market validation along that path where it took us four months to, to have an idea of, are we going to be successful at Chewy? It took us under six months to know that one of the largest Fortune 500 companies in the world wants to use our software. Right. So it's yeah. crazy that that kind of that L we took with Y Combinator and just the reason being was kind of crazy. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, then that led to 500 startups, which at the time was in a very, you know, to this time, it was a very exciting part of the the whole career what are your thoughts on accelerators i think it's got to be right place right time for you um you know we've been through a handful now um, and and if i could go back 
actually, I don't even want to think like that. If I was to start a new company, I would I would very deliberately think about what you are getting for you know that money or or even the the resources or network that you're buying into there. And I think 500 startups was important for us because it brought us to San Francisco, right. which we always wanted to do. It gave us a larger network. It gave us a name behind us, and it, and it gave us I think the resources that we needed at that stage to to really grow. Now I think you run into a lot of the mentor whiplash and you know, th- their spray and pray uh, strategy. And at the time, it did, that, that wasn't the strategy we should have taken. Um, and we learned it very quickly. And so, you know, there is room to push back on, on those mentors and those advisors and those programs. And that's actually what I like the most about it because they're receptive of that feedback and, and then they can help you with the, the next idea. So I thought it was very beneficial to us. So True Face is born, the evolution of True Face, the next chapter. So we get rid of the hardware. We decide we're going to become a software company. What next? What do those days look like? Those those intro days to that. Was it a smooth ship or was it kind no. of a rough transition? <laughs> you remember we were we were eleven people dropped down to, to three people, and so, you know, you really don't think about the emotional impact that that has on on a team, and me specifically, you know, having to let those individuals go is not an easy thing to do. You're paying for their livelihood, or you're employing their livelihood, so it's it's not you know. It's not the most fun, but it's it's the only decision you can make. And uh, you know, going through that transition, we had a, a very heavily focused hardware mindset. And so, understanding now how do you sell software versus how do you sell hardware? I mean, you, you remember we're still trying to figure it out. Um, you know, do we want to be a monthly subscription product? Do we want to be an annual subscription product? Do we want you know, you know do you want to be a SaaS company? And if so, how do you do B two B SaaS sales? So it's it's not easy. And I think it's, you know, it's the ability to learn quickly that that is what's helped us grow. And it, it definitely wasn't smooth. It's still not smooth. And, you know, I, I would argue that probably anyone in this seed series age stage is there's nothing smooth about it. <laughs> uh, it's still learning. You, know, right. you have to learn quickly. Yeah. The added pressure of I think well, a lot of people want to become their own boss and they want to be, you know, the, the dream of being a CEO of a company. They don't really think about the side effects that come with that. Like you said, being responsible for people's livelihoods. You went through this situation where, you know, you had a temporary setback, but it set you up for the future. And now True Face seems to be doing pretty good. All right. <laughs> We're happy about where we are today. Yeah, yeah it's great, man. So I want to kind of get into a little bit about the technology and, and what's going on in the industry and just kind of a b- brief intro. What exactly is face recognition? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, face recognition is is taking a mathematical representation of a human face and, and comparing it to something else, so like a template. So, you know, we are extracting the features on your face, the measurements from your nose to your eye to your ear to your mouth, mathematically representing that, and then looking at does this match a profile picture that is also a mathematical representation. So you're really not matching two images, you're matching two sets of, of unique numbers. And I think that, you know, when people think of facial recognition, they think, oh, you've got my picture or, oh, you're scanning a picture. But really, it's, it's all, it's fundamentally math. It's the geometry of the face. So you're taking that picture and turning it into essentially a giant equation, which represents that face. Yes, correct. And are these equations diverse amongst everyone has their own way of creating these equations? Right. So every company has a proprietary way or a unique way of creating facial recognition templates so if you were to take a facial recognition template built on true face and and then you took you know that try to run it through amazon's recognition software it will not work it, it would be a complete error it's done two very different ways so you cannot transfer those templates across you have these these strings of numbers and like you mentioned it's hard to uh, basically put those back together if you don't have the foundation it sounds like there can be a lot of privacy concerns amongst that. You know, what are the privacy concerns when dealing with face recognition? I think it's really important first to to segment facial recognition out. So there's three pillars to facial recognition. There is what would be personal private facial recognition. So the way in which you unlock your phone, you unlock your phone to access apps, to send emails, to send text messages, and that information is stored on the phone. So the device itself. Then you have the you know, kind of public opt-in facial recognition. So at airports, um, you think about access control, using your face to gain access somewhere. You are opting into that. You are opting into your phone. So those are two, two of the most in-demand uh, areas of facial recognition that we see. And the third pillar 
is, is where we see everyone's concern, and that is surveillance. It is running real-time facial recognition amongst a crowd of people looking for individuals. So you really have to think about these, th these three things in silos. You've got your device side, personal opt-in. You want to access your phone, so you're going to use facial recognition to do so. You've got your opt-in in a public way. If you want to access an ATM with less fraud, you, know, you can use your face. If you want to go through clear at the airport, you can use your face. So you're still opting into those programs. And then the third, like I mentioned, is that, is that surveillance where you don't necessarily know that you know, facial recognition is being run. And that's the most concerning. Um, so, you know, it's really important in this space, specifically in, in facial recognition, but more and more generally in computer vision, that there there's transparency about how this technology is used. And I, I think that the headlines are driving a lot of fear, a lot of fear of surveillance. You know, you, you see what's happening in China and everyone's worried that's going to happen in the U.S. or, you know, London's in, a, in, a, in an uproar about it right now. And so transparency and regulation um, are really what will help alleviate that concern around, you know, are we being monitored 24-7 through our faces? Um, because right now, I, I think something, something important to note is we are being monitored through our phones, through our credit card purchases, through social media, and, and, and we're not reinventing anything. You know, the cameras exist, so the cameras are already ingesting the information. It's, it's really how do we make sense of that information that's coming in and and I echo the concern of a lot of people. I don't want to see a surveillance state. You know, you don't want to see a surveillance state. And that's not what we're empowering. We're trying to help people make better decisions faster, more efficiently, and, and really to live in a safer environment. Right. And, and you touched on it a little bit, but how do you think the industry can deploy facial recognition in an ethical way? I think that, you know, it's important to... to to break that down even further, um, you know, there's a there's a way in which this technology can be used for good, um, for safety, and you know, you think about what happened in, in Atlanta at the Super Bowl, and they've got, you know, how many thousand cameras monitoring hundreds of thousands of people, and if you can catch one or two potential threats, the technology has done its job. But to do that, you've got to scan crowds of 50, 60,000 people at a time, and so. You know, it's important there that you are you have privacy baked in, uh, meaning, you know, for instance, some one of the things that we do is we blur all the faces in real time that are not people of interest. So, you know, the way in which that works is you upload a gallery of you know, potential threats to that environment. You've got their images. We create the face template of, the, of those images. And then that's all you're looking looking for in these video feeds. So anyone that walks by who doesn't want their face or, you know, who is not a person of interest is not actually having their information stored anywhere. It's, it's being completely eliminated in real time. So it's what we call fleeting data. Uh, that's one way in which, you know, we have as a company taken an approach about this technology to ensure privacy is being upheld. Can you, you mentioned the Super Bowl situation. Can you give a quick rundown of what that meant? Uh, they were the, the police forces were using facial recognition on the crowds at the Super Bowl, and it, it was a, a way for them to try and trying to detect threats that they knew were potential threats before you know before any action happened. I think unfortunately that the world that we live in, um, you know whether it's a concert venue, uh, a sporting event, just an area where a lot of people are 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 going, music festivals, you run the risk of of bad actors or or people who want to inflict harm, and you know we see it just far too often and so you know if we can use technology to to help the this already very difficult job of monitoring these these crowds we want to we want to empower these people with information and it's so important to know that facial recognition is not meant to make a decision it is meant to be a point of information to to make a decision so at the end of the day the human has to make the decision and we stress that in, in all of our documentation uh, it's meant to provide an extra layer of intelligence. It is not meant to make a decision. Right. So there may be a lot of concerns over data storage, right? Like you see things going on. People have all this sensitive information. What are your thoughts on data storage and how the industry should approach that? I think data storage is critical. This information is, is very sensitive. And so, I mean, as is your credit card information, as is your thumbprint on your phone, as is all, all of your banking, you know, all of your personal information, it's your information, so it should be stored properly. And one of the ways in, in which Trueface specifically is, has gone about this approach is 
we've localized all of our technology to our client's infrastructure. So no data is ever leaving their infrastructure. It never comes back to us. We don't see it. We can't take it and sell it to another client. They can't take it and sell it to another client. So it has to remain on their infrastructure, completely siloed from the outside world. So there is no data transfer. And I think that that's critically important to, to the advancement of this industry because you know we saw what happened with one of the social networks where they were selling all of our information and, and making a profit off of it. You know, at the end of the day, your personal information is your currency and, and you should choose how that information is used. And if it's sold, you should profit off of it. So in this environment, you know, if you have if you have facial recognition running, for one, people should be aware it's running. And for two, you should be able to opt in or opt out of that program, you know, however you please. And it's just important to, to make sure that that data is being treated properly and it's being stored properly. It's being encrypted properly. It's not leaving that infrastructure. Right. It makes a lot of sense. And there's gonna there's a lot of regulation. It's changing every single day. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you guys look at the news, there's always new news articles and new releases and very exciting industry going on. And, and a lot's going to change just over the next year. Recently, San Francisco banned face recognition. <laughs> Can you talk about what went down there? Yeah, you see me smiling because you know they didn't ban it. Um, <laughs> so San Francisco did not ban facial recognition. What they did was was make it so that the police force, the local law enforcement, if they want to use facial recognition, have to get a warrant to use it. Now, again, you should know that San Francisco was not using facial recognition. So this was a preemptive strike in in order to to kind of alleviate people's fears about the city using this technology. I am unaware of any law enforcement agency in the United States that is using facial recognition in real time. So, you know, we know New York is using facial recognition forensically, where they've been able to, I think in 2018, they they ended up catching a thousand extra people based on facial recognition information or based on, you know, them getting a lead through facial recognition information. So San Francisco did not ban it. They just made it so you've got to go through a process to use it now. And, you know, I think we will start to see more cities uh, you know, adopt a similar approach here. And it's, it's somewhat unfortunate in the, in the way that it's working because it really should be federally regulated. In my opinion, is that the cities are doing it because federally we're not acting fast enough. And so the cities are trying to ensure that, you know, the privacy of their citizens, which they should. But what's the ultimate goal of law enforcement? And it's to provide safety. And so, you know, if, if you are eliminating a tool which the commercial commercial space can use from law enforcement you're now putting them at a disadvantage they now have less you know less intelligence or less tools to do their job and you know i think this is a a good segue into china china has invested billions and billions and billions of dollars in artificial intelligence you know as we see they've i think they've published now almost five times the amount of patents as the united states has in facial recognition it's an incredible number. It just shows you where they see the future of this technology. And, and we live in a very different world than they do in China. Um, you know, that is, they're, they're using facial recognition in some questionable ways, in, in my opinion. But we need to continue to invest in this technology and to understand the limitations, to understand how we regulate it, to make sure that we can use this technology as a tool but it's not infringing on people's privacy. It's not helping target individuals, and it's just being used in a proper way. But I, I do not think that outright banning it is is the way to go. So stopping the advancement in ter- in fear of it getting out of control is not the play. Right. That's letting fear dictate you know the future of the technology, and and I don't think that that's a good way to to approach any technology. Really, you know, we we as the operators know the limitations better than the legislators do, and so it's important that we have a a for one that we have a discussion but for two that we have a seat at that table and you know all the reports that have come out are you know about banning about the bias in facial recognition it's all negative and so the conver the public conversation is heavily weighted to one side right now and you know it's just not it's not the appropriate way to understand or to to make an informed decision so it's it's really critical that you know we understand as a society what banning this technology really means to the advancement of our society and you know and what we could actually do if we came together and said here are the limitations here how we you know remove some of those limitations with time with training data with more real information and you know here's where we project to be in three years 
but right now China's five years ahead of us and you know it's it's going to be a race to the t- you know well, it'll be a race to the bottom but you know we we need to compete from a from a talent perspective from a technical perspective and and if we shut it down we will not compete at all do you think that the u.s has a chance to catch up with china within the next five years i think we've got very intelligent and talented individuals in the u.s and i, I think that our our um, government is now seeing the the reality of what investment in artificial intelligence means and so you know from an in- infrastructure perspective we have the tools to catch up to China. We absolutely do. MIT announced that they are, are you know, a $1 billion plan to create a new college for AI. Exactly. And so that shows you that, you know, people here in the US are aware that this is going to be a critical, you know, industry. Artificial intelligence has been around for a very long time, but it's just recently taken off. And, you know, it's, it's a kind of a silly word because it encompasses a lot of things. But we need to, as a society, invest in artificial intelligence. We need to invest in teaching, you know, high schoolers how to program and, and how to build these types of algorithms and, and how to in, make inferences on them and, and to really understand what they mean. I, I think the the education department is an entirely different conversation that we could have, but you know, we're seeing it. We're seeing a lot of traction with people understanding that this is a need right now. In the most simple ways for the viewers listening, what is how would you describe what exactly is artificial intelligence? That's a it's a loaded question. Uh, artificial intelligence is is trying to create processes based on what would be a human mind. So it's it's creating intelligence from a lot of data. You're taking in and ingesting you know, millions and millions and millions, billions of data points in and trying to recreate a reaction based off of those data points. So it's, it's, it's really pattern recognition. It's learning trends or patterns and data and then being able to, to drive a decision based on those. Right. So you mentioned there's a lot of different headlines and, and you mentioned the word kind of fear mongering and some of these headlines that are enticing people to you know, ask the question, is this good or is this bad? Should we be concerned or should we be stoked? How should the industry, in your view, handle privacy concerns for their customers? Transparency. So, you know, it, it's important that, that we are transparent with how we work, uh, you know, and, and what our goal and our mission is. And I think we've done a good job of that. Um, we can obviously do better, but, you know, it, it's really, it's really going to come down to, you know, does the public trust us? Do people trust us? Do people want to buy technology from Israel or would they rather buy it from the United States? And one of the things that's, that's great about, you know, being a U.S. based company and having all the work done here is the government can regulate us and, and that can provide an extra layer of trust that the public now knows that we've hit these certain benchmarks. We're being regulated by the government and, you know, they can trust what we're doing with the data or what we what we're doing or what we say we're doing is true. So I think the transparency and public trust is is a very, very big component to the adoption of this technology. Right. And a question we hear all the time is how powerful or how good is your face recognition? Again, it's kind of a loaded question. There's a lot more that goes into that. But how would you how do face recognition companies, particularly in the, in the face recognition realm, differ from one from one another? There's a variety of different ways in which concerning accuracy. Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's a variety of ways in which you could quote accuracy, um, whether it's one-to-one unlocking your phone or one-to-end, you know, finding someone in, in, a, in a space amongst a lot of people. So data at the end of the day is, is what's critically important to not only reducing bias, but providing accurate results. You need diversified data that represents the globe. And, you know, it's difficult to get that data. And so, you know, you, you have to make sure that you're obtaining that data properly and, and then that you have enough volume in which you have a representative population. And so when you hear about bias, um, facial recognition is not bias. Technology is not bias. Uh, people are bias. People collect data in biased ways and publicly available data is bias. And so when you give something, when you give a machine or an algorithm corrupt data in, you're going to have corrupt data that comes out. And if you give it bias information to train on, it's going to be biased when it outputs, you know, the results of that, the, the, the test. So, you know, it's very, very important that companies like ours, our entire industry goes out and sources data in a proper way 
and they do so with a, a properly balanced geographic set of people because otherwise you're going to run into these issues of bias that we continue to hear about. Right. Computer vision. Uh, that's a bigger word than just face recognition. It's more encompassing. What are the different pillars of computer vision? And also, could you kind of define what exactly computer vision is? Yeah, uh, it's teaching machines to see like humans uh, in the simplest form. And, you know, when we look at, you know, back to kind of true face, when we look at what's the future of, of this industry, um, facial recognition is just one component. And, and we really actually see more value in, in being a provider of, of computer vision to make more informed decisions. And that doesn't even need to include facial recognition. Um, you know, we are developing now age verification solutions, which, which you know, um, you know, we're looking at things like threat detection, so weapon recognition in schools and, and corporate offices, uh, military bases. So we are, you know, taking a very active approach to how can we make sense of information that's already being fed into cameras and, and provide real-time feedback back to the people that are supposed to be watching that, those video feeds. So when, when Trueface looks at, you know, what's the, what's the next 12 months look like? We, we are investing a lot of our time and resources in age verification and threat detection. And you know, I think it's, it's important, again, to note there that there's a proper way to do those things. Uh, with age verification, we're not actually taking facial biometrics. We've trained enough data uh, to produce an algorithm that when we scan your, you know, your face to de determine your age, uh, we're roughly two and a half years um, on either end off. And so it's very accurate. And given the environments in which we're operating in this end, we only need to know if you're under 30 or over 30. So, you know, it's a great solution for that where you know, we don't store that information. It, it runs that analysis. It says yes or no, you're over or under 30. That information is deleted and never stored. So, you know, it, it's a it's a very quick way to to improve efficiency in something like, um, you know, a casino or a retail environment where you're trying to verify age. Uh, let's just break those two topics down a little bit more and go a little bit more into detail in terms of the age recognition. Where do you see the use cases there with age recognition and how accurate is age recognition? What does that really mean to the consumer? Yeah, age recognition is very accurate, uh, and it, again, you know, even with facial recognition, today is the worst day we'll ever be, and I say this a lot, but it's true. You know, today is the worst we will be at this at this type of recognition, and so with with our age models, I think we're at two, a mean average error of two and a half years, meaning that we will predict your age within two and a half years on either side. So it's it's very accurate, um, and when you're talking about a retail environment where you know legally if you're under 30 you need to be carded or over 30 to buy alcohol you don't need to be carded we are we're absolutely hitting those marks so the the most demand that we're seeing for age verification software is in these retail environments to automate processes um, for tobacco purchases alcohol purchases and then also in the gambling space so we're seeing a lot of demand in, in casinos and then overseas uh, for entry into to gambling environments Gotcha. And then in terms of threat detection, what exactly does threat detection mean and how are you detecting threats? Yeah, threat detection is, is, a, is more of a package solution around, you know, recognizing potential threatening behavior. So a lot of people aggregating in one spot very quickly, um, you know, someone casing a building at night. So it's a, a detecting those types of anomalies. And then the most important piece is the, the real time gun detection or knife detection. So, you know, unfortunately, in 2018, we saw, I think it was 100 instances of a gun pulled on a campus uh, of a school. And so it's, it's just, it's an incredible number that, you know, it, it needs to be, you know, eliminated, really. And, you know, we built this solution to try and provide more information to the individuals monitoring those schools. You've got someone sitting in a control room, you know, monitoring 200 plus cameras in a school. It just, it doesn't work. You cannot watch that footage. And so, you know, I was in Miami not too long ago at the anniversary of, of the Parkland shooting. And, you know, you see that individual walk around in a hallway and in a stairwell with that gun for, for, you know, 30, 40 seconds. And so that gun was on camera and nothing, you know, no one saw that. So they weren't able to stop it. And I'm not saying we, can compre we could prevent that from happening, but at least we would know exactly where that person was and if that gun was a gun, you know. So it's, it's a way of, of reacting a lot faster, and in those environments, seconds do save lives. 
What do you think are some of the things that are holding back the advancement of that technology? Because when you do explain it like that, it seems like there's a lot of pros. Are there some cons to this? I think so. You know, for for one, uh, outside of the threat detection piece, if you run facial recognition in schools, you've got minors there, you need parental consent. And, you know, I think people still don't quite understand what that means, you know, what facial recognition means in that environment. And so, you know, it's it's just a mental hurdle. Um, when I look at facial recognition in a school, you know, the only thing we've talked to schools about is facial recognition to identify, you know, people that shouldn't be in that school, whether that's someone who is an alumni who's not allowed back in, someone who's caused harm to the community. You, know, you want to be aware if those people are, are in that high school, grade school, college. And, you know, unfortunately at this stage, there's no way to do that. And so having this technology run, blurring the faces of all the students in real time, but knowing that there's 30 people on a watch list that you need to find out if they're in, you know, on that premise, I think is an important use of the technology. We don't need to run facial recognition to run the threat detection technology. So we can run gun recognition across the board and not do any, rec- you know, any type of facial recognition. So you know, I do think that there is a lot of value to that technology running on school cameras. Right. So this technology is running over these school cameras and it's able to detect through the camera. So you're using the existing camera and you can detect a gun and then or a weapon or a knife or a shotgun, whatever it is, and then alert, say, the proper authorities how the client or the consumer sees best fit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a way to provide that information in real time. But the limitation is you know, the gun has to be able to be seen on that camera. And so, you know, if it's in a backpack, we can't see through the backpack, but once it's pulled out and and there's a camera there, we would be able to identify that as a weapon. I like that you said that this is the the worst the technology will ever be because it's always improving with, with more and more data. How much data is really needed before something you would consider is fantastic? That's a difficult question. Uh, each environment dictates its own need. And, uh, you know, for faces, you want millions. Uh, China has billions. So that's why they were able to advance that quickly. So I think that, you know, the more data that you can have that's diversified, the better. And by diversified, I mean angles, lighting, placements. You know, you're trying to collect the, the most wide range of diversified data that you can. So I, I don't have a number to put on that. But, you, you know, you need to start in the thousands, get up to the hundreds of the thousands, up to the millions and so on. Cool. So uh, let's talk about the, the recent news uh, headline that has been viral over the past week. Uh, viral app Face App now owns access to more than 150 million people's faces and names. And if you guys are listening to this podcast, you're probably the one of three people in the country or whatnot that have used that. It's the app that makes you look like you're 40 years older and every celebrity's doing it. It's all the buzz. But it's interesting because Face App has terms of use that you consent to when you use their, their platform. So for context, this is what you're actually giving when you use that app. You grant Face App a perpetual, irrevocable, non-exclusive, royalty-free, worldwide, fully paid, transferable, sublicensable license to use, reproduce, modify, adapt, publish, translate, create derivatives from, distribute, publicly perform, and display your user, blah, 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 blah. That's what's going down right now with every single person. And it almost seems like people have no idea. And, you know, some people are, they don't even realize it's happening. They're confused. They're outraged that this happened. Uh, do you think it's okay for FaceApp to be using that data for training? That's a difficult question because they made you consent to it. So you agreed to that if you, if you did partake in that. Um, now, you know, whether that was deceptive, it, it didn't even look deceptive because it was as you just read pretty clear what you were signing off to and you know unfortunately the day that we the the present day that we live in now people just click that box without reading it and or or the utility is is greater to them than than having to read the terms and conditions so they would prefer to post it on instagram and don't really care about the consequences so you know they did make you consent to that um and the consequence of you consenting to that is now that they basically have the information that they need from you to do whatever they want with they can advertise with your face they can you know they can post your face on a billboard it it doesn't matter you've now given them like you mentioned an irrevocable unlimited license do i think that was you know a good thing to do no um we would never do anything like that but it's you know 
it's the world we live in. You give up information to Facebook, you give it up to Snapchat, to Instagram, to Twitter, and you know, you it's a trade-off. And, and, and depending on what you care about, you'll do it. And so, you know, people people cared more to put that online than they did about the the consequences, or they just didn't want to read the, the terms and conditions. So, you know, it's difficult. Um, it's a difficult situation. It's a difficult question. And, you know, I think that people just need to be more informed about what they're doing. They need to take the time to read through things and to understand what they're actually consenting to. Because now you, you get a big uproar of people saying, well, I didn't know that, you know, they had that right. Well, if you would have read, you would have known. You know, if you would have taken the time to understand, what, first of all, who that company was, you know, where they were based. Second, you know, what are they doing with my data? Then we wouldn't have this problem. That's definitely something that I have learned throughout this process. And uh, I thank the True Face team that you got to read everything really good. I know you've corrected me multiple times, but you got to look at what you're signing up for. I, mean, I know like when you sign up for like the iTunes agreement, it's like a 15 page long document and you're like, yeah, 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 I agree. Right. How many people are actually reading those documents? Right. It's interesting. So but the risk is lower there. The risk is lower. It's a trusted brand or it should be a trusted brand. And you're talking about, you know, personal music on your laptop. I mean, did you know who FaceApp was? No. Okay, right? So you did, people don't know who they are, and you're submitting images to them. You know, that should concern you. <laughs> like on the surface, that should already concern you. You've never heard of this company, and, you know, you're just sharing information with them. Right. So just because they're on the App Store doesn't mean they're, you know, well-intentioned. Makes a lot of sense. And a very big hot topic right now in the world of face recognition and computer vision is law enforcement. Do you think that law enforcement should have access to the same technology that, say, commercial companies are able to get access to? I do think they should. Um, I think that we limit their ability to do their job if they don't have access to it. And so, you know, I'm not here to tell you I think they should run facial recognition in real time on every city corner. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that would play into that. And there's a lot of privacy concerns that I personally would be concerned with as well. So, you know, th th there is no right answer and there needs to be a public discussion about this and we need to have both sides heard. And again, you know, it's really about can we regulate it in a proper way? And can we provide people with the privacy that they, you know, that they're entitled to? to run this technology and provide a safer environment. It's, it's such a difficult conversation though, because you look at, you know, one of the officers in, in New York who said, if you remove this technology, you're significantly impacting the way in which, you know, we're able to catch individuals. They're only using it forensically, but it's speeding up their process by days. And so the fundamental job of the police is to keep us safe. That is one of their core jobs. And, and we effectively are, are, you know, as a public, or at least what we're reading in the news, are trying to limit their ability to do so. And, and it's, you know, it's based on some, some real concerns and, and some not so real concerns. So I think that, the, you know, we just need to flush out how, how can we give them these tools to make better decisions, faster decisions, more accurate decisions, more responsible decisions, you know, decisions where they're accountable for, for their actions. But we've got to be cautious of what the cost of that is. Along the same conversation about what those costs might be, there's another very big hot topic that is in the news every other week, and it's concerning racial bias with computer vision. Is the facial recognition able to um, tell a certain different type of person's of skin color better than others? And, and how does that affect the decision-making process? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a real concern for the industry. Um, and, and I alluded to it earlier. If you have biased data coming in that you train your algorithm, algorithm with, then the output is going to also be biased. So it's not that the companies or the teams or that the technology is biased at all, or even the people using it are biased. It is that if you don't have the right data to train those algorithms with, right meaning properly balanced, a diversified set of data from ethnicities from all around the world, then you're going to have, you know, these issues. And, you know, I know from 2018 to now, the entire industry has significantly reduced that bias, but it still does exist. And so, you know, I think that is part of the regulatory effort here. There needs to be a benchmark, and I believe NIST is doing it now, but there needs to be a benchmark in which you pass as a company that states that, you know, you have limited bias or as limited as you can get. 
to be able to run this technology with law enforcement. So you don't run into that concern as much with something like access control or opt-in technology. I mean, again, you've got to think about those, those pillars that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. This is only one of them. This is the non-opt-in surveillance type of, of facial recognition. When you have the opt-in public and private or opt-in digital and physical, you know, you, you don't, you're not really as concerned with that because you're matching one-to-one. On those same concerns of these large corporations having all of this information on us, that's something that you're always hearing about people talking about, you know, the, they know everything about us. I mean, just look at Facebook and look at what we're posting. It seems like a lot of times people still are surprised when what they post on social media comes back to haunt them in some way, shape, or form. We live in an entire new world where everything's out there in the public. What are some of the concerns that these large corporations have all this information for us consumers? I think it's definitely a concern um, that the aggregation of different information is coming into one, two, three, or four companies. So it's it's the monopoly of of really information, and you know we willingly give this information up online. Again, it's to social networks, it's to companies that we feel we can trust, it's the search companies that now offer things like email and so you know it it's tricky because you you want the convenience you want that service but to get that service you've got to give up information uh to me it is a concern how much of this information is held within these large companies you know you look at um one of the largest online retailers who also offer facial recognition that that to me you know and and that's the public has been concerning as we've seen that the blowback on amazon happen already um you know it's their their ability to handle that information properly it's what are they trying to empower you know what are the goals there and then are they using information that we have submitted in other forms to perpetuate their their facial recognition technology so there there just aren't the the traditional walls um, that you would have or the difficulties to get the information that you would have in a smaller company Um, and so you know it's it's a big concern it really is do you think that these companies or spaces should have to disclose to consumers when they're using this type of technology? I think that in the commercial environment, you typically are already doing that. Um, so, you know, I don't know when the law was passed, but if you walk into a, a grocery store that's running CCTV cameras, there's a sign in the window that says, you, you know, you're being recorded here. So I think that's already happening. Um, and then when you think about the, the further uses of facial recognition specifically, they're largely opt-in. You know, if you want to pay with your face to reduce fraud, you're opting into that program. If you want to withdraw money to reduce fraud with just your face, you're opting into that. If you want to move through an airport faster and you want to use um, global entry, you're opting into that. So, you know, a lot of these instances in which, you know, you're mentioning here in the commercial environment are opt-in. Um, and so you're, you're, you are saying, yes, I want to participate in this program. So by myself walking into any sort of uh, big box retailer or store and there says there's live cctv camera footage i as a consumer should understand that they may be running analytics on what you're doing and what's going on when you're in that store well i I think the the there is cctv you know cameras running right now is, is is one step the next is we're using you know analytic software or software to analyze this space as well so I think they have to be clear about that, whether they're just recording or they are analyzing. Um, and, you know, I am unaware of any retailers that are actively using this technology in real time as well. So I think we, we will likely get there. Um, but at this stage, you know, I, I think it's first important to know that wherever you go, there are cameras. There's 650 million cameras in the world. There's a camera everywhere you go. So you're already being, you know, to some degree watched. So what would you say is the chances that I, as any consumer, have participated in facial recognition? You have an iPhone, right? I do. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, you know, again, you know, Apple did a great job of introducing facial recognition for access to your phone. It wasn't the first handset to do so. So they weren't the first, but they were the ones that, you know, quote unquote, made it acceptable or normal and are normalized the technology. And now they have uh, advertising on TV, TV commercials about facial recognition. So, you know, a lot of people have probably already seen it in one way or another. I mean, if you travel internationally, you use facial, a lot of people are using facial recognition to do so. From LA to London, you know, now you board that airline with just your face. And, and I've, you know, I've actually opted out of that. 
So I wanted to see how the gate agents reacted when I said, I don't want to do this. And, uh, you know, they, they were fine. I didn't have, like, they, they weren't, like, upset about it. They, were, they weren't pushy about it. They were just like, all right, well, then you've got to do the normal process. And, and frankly, like, I, I've done it a few times now where I've gone and, and used my face to board that plane. But, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's becoming more widespread because of the convenience and the security that it provides. How, what do you think the chances are, say, in the next 24 months versus five years versus 10 years that I will, as a consumer of the world, walking around, doing my dailies, will participate in facial recognition? I think it's very, very likely. Very likely. Yes. <laughs> Do you think the uh, Apple did a good job with rolling out FaceApp? Do you think that it could have went smoother? Or do you think it was good for, say, the industry of facial recognition? Do you think it was a good step forward? Apple did a good job of introducing it in a way in which people felt comfortable. So, you know, I think it, you know, it, it definitely helped the industry. Um, it helped people look at facial recognition as a new tool to gain authorization or access or to eliminate repetitive tasks like opening your phone. Uh, so, it, you know, I think they, they absolutely did a good job for the industry. A big issue that a lot of people have with face recognition is, is the idea of it being tricked. A question I know we receive all the time is, what if I'm wearing sunglasses? What if I'm wearing glasses? What if I have a beard? Um, what if I take a cutout of a face and put it in front of a picture? Can that technology be tricked? So in a big scale, can face recognition be tricked? It's not as simple as a yes or no there. Simple answer is yes, it can be tricked, but you have to look at the environment in which it's running. So, you know, if you're running it for access control at an airport or a building, you holding a cutout of me is a lot more obvious, uh, and, and people would see that. And so you, you wouldn't tend to do that there. Now, if you're trying to evade facial recognition, I would, I would also question what your motivation is or what your incentive is to hide your face or to trick the technology. So I think that there's something else going on there. It's not simply can we trick it or can we not trick it or can I evade it or can I not? Like you're actively trying to evade it for a reason and understanding that reason would be helpful. Now, if you are a criminal and, and you're trying to you know, fake a bank account or to fake you know, the opening of a bank account with a picture of me, then you know there has to be parameters in place to detect those types of things and so you you as a facial recognition provider need to ensure that you cannot you you do not allow people to use you know to use cutouts or images of other people to gain authorization so you know there has to be there has to be those benchmarks or or you know box checks in place to ensure that that doesn't that does not happen and we recently, I know Trueface has been having a lot of exciting traction, and there's been a lot of news recently going down. And one of those is that Trueface has partnered with the U.S. Air Force. Can you go into a little bit on, on what you guys are doing with them? What we're doing with them? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be unbiased as possible, people. But <laughs> uh, Yes, yeah, so we, we're working with the Air Force now on helping to promote a, a more safe access uh, access to the Air Force bases. So, you know, they're trying to automate the process of identifying the individuals as they enter the base. And facial recognition is one way to make it more efficient. And so we are working closely with them on understanding who is gaining access to those bases at what times and if they should or shouldn't be there. What excites you the most being a founder inside of this industry that seems like it's in its infancy stage, it's growing very quickly? What excites you the most? What gets your heart pumping from day to day when you see these news and you're, and you're constantly doing what you do? I think it's, you know, it's a complete uphill battle for us as a, you know, like I said earlier, we're moving into more of a computer vision company and it's, a, it's an uphill battle because no one wants to write about the benefits of facial recognition. No one wants to put that out in the news. They all want to talk about, you know, how this could harm us, the privacy concerns. And so, you know, getting our voice heard is, is never an easy thing and, you know, I think that, that that excites me because we're we're in a position now where we're, we are going to help form this industry. Uh, us and, and the competitors that we have, and, and really, the, you know, they're more friends than competitors, at least in my opinion. Everyone's working for a similar or, or motivated by a similar goal here. And so, you know, as a U.S. company, we band with those other U.S. companies trying to understand how do we all shape this industry you know, how do we provide the right tools to the right people to get right, the right information? 
So it's just a really, really unique position in history for us to be able to you know, somewhat pave that path. And, and to try things out with some of the largest companies in the world to get their feedback, you know, to work with innovation, innovation departments. I think we just have a really unique opportunity right now in the market. And, you know, everyone thinks it, you know, I've heard a lot, oh, you guys are in the right place at the right time. It's like, yeah, in 2012, <laughs> you know, it, it was not an overnight thing. We've, we've battled and battled and battled. And back in 2012, we made the prediction that facial recognition would be something that people wanted. And, you know, now we definitely see it is something that people want, but there's there's more to that than facial recognition. So, you know, I think it's just a really, really exciting time to participate in this industry. Things never go to, as smooth as you think, right? The, the fairy tale of the startup, that could be its own, you know, I, there's probably plenty of shows about it, but people have this fairy tale in their, in their mind that, oh, like, you know, I'm going to start a company, it's going to go great, it's going to go blah, but... I mean, you've hit rock bottom a few different times in this life term of, of just you running this company. Is there a specific time that you can talk about that you kind of hit your like lowest point when you were like, shit, man, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can like what's going on here. You know, you've you've got to see me somewhat evolve in this role. And, you know, I, I remember back in San Francisco, I think you said something to me like, go take your your forest time. And, you know, that's something that, that you recognize that I needed. I needed time to myself. I needed to put my phone away and I needed just to go out and think. And so, you know, I, I would say that you do run into those, those, you know, hills and trials. Like you, it, it, it sucks at a lot of the, you know, a lot of the time it sucks. A lot of the time, you know, people are telling you this isn't going to work. They're telling you it's a bad idea. You know, you're having trouble raising money. And so you're just getting a lot of negative feedback. And it's difficult to emotionally deal with that. And so, you know, you've got that and then you've got tension on the team because things aren't going as well as they should be and everyone's wondering why. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's really the, the entire effort, that entire journey, uh, you know, you have to have that balance. You have to have the downs to have the ups. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's just been a long journey. Everyone needs their forest time, you know, got to unplug, go get, get with your chi, feeling, feeling good. So... Sean, this is a, a question for everybody that's listening that is a very awesome way of kind of looking back in time. And the idea is very simple. Uh, if you could have went back in time, maybe when you're in school, before you started this first business, before you started your first company, all this, and you could have told yourself one, two, or three things. And you're like, listen, listen, brother, like this is Sean in the future. You're looking at yourself like, what's going on? If you could have said one, two, or three things that would have saved you a ton of time, money, and maybe just personal headache what do you think those things would be i think i would have taken uh courses in things like doing taxes reading through ndas reading through you know contracts that stuff occupied a lot of my time um you know, it's it's not learning the tools that you need as a professional in the, in the startup space because when you're at a big corporate company you've got those resources that can help you with all of your personal you know finances your anything like that and when you're in a startup, you know, you've got no health care, or at least we didn't at that stage. And you have to just figure everything out for yourself. And so, you know, you can't really afford lawyers at those rates to look through contracts. So you, you are needing to actively learn on the go while also trying to grow a business, you know, all of these other things. So it's, it's marketing, it's sales, it's legal, uh, it's the technical side of it. It's the fundraising side of it. So, it, you know, it's, I just would have, I would have started learning earlier, I think. And, and the other bit is mental health. I think it's, it's critical to being in a good balance position in your mind. And, and that translates into how, how the company operates. And so you have to take the time to yourself. You've got to disconnect. You've got to just sit and think, uh, you know, people meditate, people do yoga, people run, people work out, they play basketball. You know, it's finding what works for you. What works for you? meditation and yoga and basketball and basketball Bas yeah basketball is more to get the aggression out yeah so there's a big lesson there is you got to make sure you're doing things that you enjoy your head is just always full with problems running a business there's always a problem there's always a fire to put out I remember we had Paul Kesarwani in from Cushion and he said that being a CEO of a company is like being a glorified janitor you're always just cleaning up messes and that can run you down and that can always just take take pieces out of you but if you can keep you know keep your head straight it seems to be what a, most the most successful people are able to do and they're also able to separate going home and business not taking business home 
um, which is something that I find fascinating just in startups. So a big theme that we have on this show, Len Jones Party of Two, is basically what would you say to that person that's right on the edge of, say, starting their own business? Maybe, you know, they're thinking of maybe get, starting their own startup company or they're just trying to get into a home-based business or just being in business for themselves. Maybe they're making a ton of money. They have the dream job. They got the Equinox membership. Their lifestyle is fantastic. They're eating out three times a week, but they just feel like, you know, they're not really reaching their full potential. Like they could be doing something more fulfilling. Maybe they're making less money, but more fulfilled, whatever. Or on the flip side, you have someone that's just working some dead end job. That's just sucking the soul out of them. It's just some thing that's not making them feel fulfilled they're not a part of a startup they're not a part of a community like a team they just kind of feel like a number and they're thinking of really stepping out and making moves what would you say to that person that's kind of right on the cusp and they're scared to kind of jump in for the first time have to jump in and and i've i've watched a few of my friends do just that you know and, and they've come to me for advice and the only way to do it is to jump in no one knows there's no blueprint there's no formal path to take um, as my dad always tells me, you make a plan and then life happens. So, you know, it's, there is no right or wrong. The only way to take that next step is to take the next step. It's to jump in, it's to quit your job. It's to, you know, start doing research. And I'm not saying that and like, take all the risk in the world. You know, I was in a place in my life where I could take the risk. I didn't have anything that was keeping me where I was. And I had saved money from the job that I was working at. And so, you know, I, I think it's it's important to take a calculated or informed risk. And if you are questioning it, considering it, talk to people that have done it, find out what their experience was like, learn from it. Like it's the best education you could ever get, and do it. And and you know, I think you can see, um, sitting in in our position now, you can see when someone is deprived of their energy, and and you know it. You people, you know, they're not as happy around you anymore. They're not as excited around it you know, about what they're doing to talk about what they're doing. But then when you see someone who is excited, you're like, wow, that person, you know, has got some energy, has got some power behind them. So, you know, it's, it's very obvious. And I think when you, when you do decide to take that jump, you feel such a burden, you know, relieved, you, such a relief. And, and it's so exciting. And, you know, I think getting caught, like you have to, you have to enjoy that for that period of time, but you can't get caught in that emotion because then you're going to start questioning yourself. Like you go through that cycle of like, this is super exciting to, Oh, what am I doing? You know, did I just leave this job? Like, why, why would I ever have done that? I had left such a good job. I was making money. I was getting a paycheck. I had health insurance. So, you know, you need to find people that you can surround yourself with that can kind of coach you through that. Um, but it's critical to just take that step, learn, get educated, take it. Make the moves, baby. Making moves. So, Sean, anything else you'd want to tell the people, the people of the podcast and just people out there that are trying to make moves? You know, I'm happy to talk with any of them that are trying to make moves. You know, I think I actually think it would be great for for you to tell your story about how you got involved with us and and what the first couple of weeks were like. Right, right, yeah. Well, if you guys uh, if you guys listen to the podcast with Vima, W2F happened, number eight, our most popular episode. It was crazy. Vima got shut down. I was living the dream, making fantastic money. And uh, it was amazing. My life was fulfilled. And then overnight, I lost it all. And I was like, damn, I got to go back to school, man. I was like, oh, this blows. I had a year left. Went back to school, felt super disenfranchised, didn't like the stuff I was learning. I had a taste of entrepreneurship and startups. And, you know, once you get a taste, you know, you want the whole pie. And I just... I remember I was during my finals week and I was super depressed studying for some stupid midterm that or final exam that I didn't care anything about. I was just doing it to make my family happy. And I was like, all right, well, I know I personally didn't have an idea to start my own company. So I wanted to find a startup that I could be an integral part, learn from the beginning. So I reached out to about 200 different companies on like Angel's List, TechCrunch, um, just went ham and uh, heard back from about 10 different people, companies. One of them was some dude named Sean Moore. And uh, Sean said, well, we're not really hiring any sales guys right now, but uh, you can help me do some sort of task. And he basically made me, asked me to create this list. And I created that list. Do you remember that? I do. I do. Yep. And uh, next thing you know, four and a half years later, we out here. Yeah. I remember we, I was in New York, I think a couple of weeks after, and we met up at one of those startup events there. Uh, you had high and tight short hair, uh, very clean cut and oversized polo on. And <laughs> so thank you. you've definitely come a long way. Yes. My, my stylist Skylar over here has, has helped me out, but that's a good example of taking chances. You never know 
who you're going to reach out to. If you're looking to make that move, throw some fishing lines out there. If you're thinking right now, it's doing your own gig, just go out there. If you want to make a big sale, get a big funnel, throw some stuff out there, stir up the pot. Something amazing is going to happen. And maybe you get a Sean Moore come into your life. So Sean, thank you so much. If, how can people follow you if they want to continue this journey? Uh, LinkedIn is the best way just to search Sean Moore on LinkedIn. Sean Moore. All right. With that said, Hakuna Matata, we appreciate you till next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Len Jones Party of Two. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review and subscribe to stay up to date on our new episodes. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.